During our last lecture, we were uh, talking about uh, fiber optic uh, gyroscope and uh, 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 we were looking at the principle of uh, behind the fiber optic gyroscope, which is uh, uh, what we identified as a Sagnac effect. So, essentially uh, we are looking at phase changes between uh, clockwise propagating waves and uh, uh, counterclockwise propagating waves and uh, uh, either these are the counterclockwise counter clockwise propagating waves and uh, then we said uh, there will be a phase difference whenever uh, there is a rotation uh, which is what we are actually interested in uh, measuring okay through this uh, Sagnac interferometer. So, let us go ahead and try to design uh, what is called an interferometric uh, fiber optic gyroscope FOG in, in short right. It is called interferometric because obviously, it depends on the interference between the clockwise and the counterclockwise uh, waves ok. So, what exactly uh, would, would we like to achieve? We will like to find a relation between uh, let us say the uh, rotation rate that is what we want to measure uh, which is typically, uh, typically expressed in terms of uh, degree per hour. So, we want to find a relation between the rotation rate um, and uh, the phase change, the phase change due to rotation right and and uh, uh, also want to look at uh, the physical parameters how the physical parameters uh, affect the uh, relationship between the rotation rate and the phase change uh, that that we obtain due to uh, rotation so um, this is basically uh, in a physical parameters as such that uh, this is uh, corresponding to the uh, velocity of light in the medium uh, of light uh, the uh, the the radius of of this coil here and so on radius of coil etc okay so, let us go ahead and try to um, get a relationship between all of this. So, to do that let us actually redraw this uh, uh, fiber optic gyroscope which is the Sagnac interferometer configuration. So, let us say it's, we are coming off into a loop and uh, this is basically your 50 50 splitter. So, this is your incoming radiation and uh, that sets off uh, uh, what did we use for the clockwise is uh, blue. This is your clockwise propagating wave and then uh, it also sets off a counterclockwise propagating wave which uh, comes around and interferes with the clockwise propagating wave. And um, what we uh, looked at was actually uh, this uh, let us say the radius of the coil is r and uh, because of this uh, rotation uh, which we calling as omega we are having <coughs> a change in the uh, reference point as far as the interference is concerned and that uh, we identified uh, corresponds to omega times t. Uh, what is T? T is the round trip uh, time for any one of these uh, uh, two waves ok. And of course, we are going to try to say that the round trip time actually changes uh, for bet uh, between the clockwise and the counterclockwise uh, waves. So, let us actually say ok, this is what we were at uh, before. So, we had a expression for delta phi as uh, omega times uh, delta t where delta t is the 
change in the round trip time for the clockwise and counterclockwise wave. So, let us try to quantify that. So, delta T is going to be uh, T C W minus T C C W ok and uh, when you look at the round trip time for the uh, uh, C W wave uh, without any rotation that is going to correspond to the circumference of this uh, coil here divided by the velocity with which uh, the wave is actually going to propagate. Um, so, that is 2 pi r over uh, v g, but now uh, under the influence of uh, rotation. So, uh, under rotation what we find is uh, uh, you know this is 2 pi uh, you have 2 pi radians and for the uh, clockwise propagating wave that is actually uh, that angle is uh, increased by uh, capital omega times t multiplied by r and what is the velocity of light in this uh, medium. Uh, Let us say this we are considering a fiber. So, we are going to be uh, looking at the group velocity uh, in of light in the fiber which is given by V g and V g of course, you know uh, can be written in terms of uh, velocity of light in free space with c over n effective uh, this is the effective refractive index that the wave sees within this fiber. So, that is for the C w and similarly for the um, C c w you have 2 pi and uh, uh, for the C c w case it is actually uh, minus omega t multiplied by r divided by v g right. Um, and so, th this is going to be uh, 2 times uh, t uh, which uh, which corresponds to uh, 2 pi r over v g. Well, maybe we can just write it out in a minute. So, this is 2 times r times uh, t divided by uh, v g multiplied by uh, this uh, capital omega which is the uh, rotation rate right. And uh, of course, we know that uh, so, we can write uh, T is uh, 2 pi r divided by V g. So, we can actually bring that into this expression and so, we can uh, write this as uh, delta T equals 4 pi r uh, square divided by uh, V g square uh, multiplied by uh, capital omega right. So, that is actually the delta t and this implies that uh, delta phi if you write it that is going to be uh, 2 pi f multiplied by this quantity and uh, we know that v g over f is uh, lambda. So, you have a 2 pi multiplied by 4 pi. So, that you have 4 pi square r square divided by uh, v g multiplied by lambda right. Lambda is nothing but v g divided by f uh, by uh, this if you just expand that is 2 pi f. So, v g over f is actually what is giving you this lambda multiplied by this uh, capital omega ok. So, this now is uh, the phase change that you incur uh, because of rotation ok. And uh, interesting thing to note here is uh, this is the phase change that we incur for uh, a single uh, loop right, a uh, single fiber loop, but uh, you could possibly increase this delta phi right by um, going for multiple loops. Basically, you can take the fiber and, and you can actually make a coil uh, let us say with uh, n turns and uh, if you do that, then this 
entire thing, uh, this delta phi that we have is going to be scaled by that factor. So, you can just, right, sorry. You can just say that corresponds to n times for, uh, uh, for n turns, we get uh, delta phi equals to n times uh, to uh, 8 pi square r square will be g u. So, that is actually a major advantage of using a fiber because uh, you can just coil the fiber and uh, you do not have to worry about alignment and anything like that. So, that is one of the key reasons why these uh, gyroscopes uh, people uh, prefer a fiber optic gyroscope because you can just coil the fiber uh, relatively easily and you can get a, a scaling in terms of uh, the sensitivity uh, with a factor of uh, n. Okay. There are some downsides of that, I will we'll come back to that uh, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, now, this is <coughs> what we uh, actually achieved uh, by, uh, you know, by looking at just uh, a change in the uh, transit time that is the round trip time uh, uh, for the clockwise and counterclockwise is, but uh, we talked about potentially looking at this uh, from a perspective of uh, a Doppler shift. So, essentially uh, you can think of this to be similar to uh, a case where uh, let us say you have a sound wave uh, uh, propagating. Um, and uh, it's it's getting uh, reflected. So the wave is propagating. It's getting reflected off the mirror. Uh, let's say just just you're looking at the echo from from an object, okay. And uh, when the object is stationary, whatever wave is uh, uh, going in, uh, whatever frequency you have, that's the same frequency you're going to actually get back. But uh, suppose your uh, object is moving away. Okay. If the object is moving away, this uh, sinusoidal wave, uh, this acoustic wave is now going to get stretched. Okay. And uh, so, when a, whatever is actually reflected back from this object is going to have a downshift in terms of the frequency. Okay. And, um, that uh, uh, downshift is what we call as a Doppler shift. So, it is uh, it's, it's downshift if, if the object is moving away, but if the object is moving towards the uh, uh, wave, then uh, that ends up actually compressing the wave somewhat and that actually means that the reflected wave is going to have an upshift in terms of the frequency. So, you have a similar situation here in which uh, you know we, we see that the count uh, the clockwise wave is, uh, is is seeing a reference that's moving away right so it's going to uh, see a downshift so so the clockwise will will have basically um, uh, you you have uh, omega minus uh, say delta omega d is a shift uh, divided by 2 whereas um, for the counterclockwise wave, uh, the reference is coming towards the wave. So, in, in that case, you have omega plus delta omega d divided by 2. Okay. So, that it is going to have a relative um, uh, uh, shift and uh, that, that total shift is actually what we are calling as delta omega d. Um, but, but uh, you know, you just attribute to the clockwise and the counterclockwise, that is why you have delta omega d divided by 2. Um, so, if essentially, you know, delta phi, if you look at that Doppler picture, that would corresponds to, that would correspond to delta omega d multiplied by the round trip time, right. So, that will give you the delta phi and, and of course, in, in that case also you can actually, um, you know, find out this uh, uh, delta difference and uh, so delta omega d can be written in terms of uh, delta beta um, and, and, and once you work that out, you find that you have a similar 
sort of expression uh, that, that you get. Okay. So, you can either go for this uh, time picture or the frequency picture both are equivalent you should uh, get the same uh, result in both cases. Okay. So, now the question is um, how do we uh, increase um, delta phi? Obviously, uh, this delta phi is going to be converted to a change in intensity right because of uh, your uh, uh, because this is an interferometer right. So, the changes in phase is, is going to correspond to change in intensity and you want as large a change in intensity as possible. Um, so, so, so th the question is can we actually uh, increase that. Uh, delta phi. How do you increase that? Well, um, so delta phi is proportional to rotation rate. So, higher the rotation rate then uh, you can also uh, increase uh, uh, delta phi. Uh, so, that is obvious, but uh, uh, you can also increase this uh, r that is the radius of the loop. So, you can um, uh, essentially uh, go for a larger radius and uh, uh, and, and, and you could uh, uh, increase delta phi, but of course, you may be uh, limited uh, in terms of the size of the gyroscope. You cannot just make a very large gyroscope, you need to um, keep it relatively small. So, um, so that might limit it, but you do have a relatively uh, what looks like a relatively free parameter in n. So, let us actually rewrite this. Now, you, you do find that there is a 2 pi r component right which uh, is corresponding to the circumference of this uh, coil over here and uh, n times 2 pi r what does that represent? So, that is basically n times of the circumference which corresponds to the length of the loop, length of the fiber in the loop. So, I can actually now write this as uh, delta phi. Uh, if I take that uh, uh, circumference as 2 pi r, if I take that out, I have a 4 pi r multiplied by the length of the loop divided by v g times lambda multiplied by uh, omega, right. So, that is a easier expression to deal with. So, now we can actually look at uh, what are the relative uh, quantities here. So, uh, what exactly? So, let us just get a feel for uh, what are the relative values that we are dealing with. So, to do that, let us actually start putting some numbers. Um, uh, suppose we want to build uh, um, a navigational grade, uh, uh, you know, uh, gyroscope. Uh, suppose, uh, suppose we want to build something with uh, which is capable of picking up omega uh, of 10 power minus 3 degree per hour. Okay. If you want to um, pick uh, that small uh, rotation rate, let us just see what does the entail in terms of delta phi. To determine that, we need to of course, uh, substitute values for some of these other things. So, um, let us choose uh, lambda to be 1.5 microns, right. So, 1.5 happens to be the optical communication wavelength. So, the components are available relatively easily at uh, 1.5 micron and, um, and then the group velocity you can say it is about the effective index about 1.46, but let us just approximate that uh, to be about 1.5. So, the group velocity you can approximate it as 2 into 10 power 8 uh, meters per second because we are just trying to get some order of magnitude numbers here. Okay. Um, and then uh, let us uh, choose uh, r. Uh, so, r should not be too large uh, uh, because it, it might make uh, the entire gyroscope very bulky. Uh, Let us just choose a r of like uh, 10 centimeter. Okay. This is already uh, on the higher side, but let us let us just uh, take uh, something like that, right. Uh, something that uh, basically uh, 
it is it is uh, the radius is uh, corresponding to 4 inches uh, which is the size of my palm here. Um, uh, so, you can imagine what is the size of that loop is going to be. And um, let us say we choose uh, L uh, which is at, at this point a free parameter, but let me just say L is uh, about uh, 200 meters. Okay. So, if I substitute all of this, I will find delta phi is equal to um, 4 into 3.14 multiplied by r is 0 0.1 multiplied by L is 200. So, r is given in 10 centimeters that, but we are converting everything into meters. So, that is that is 0 0.1 meters divided by uh, Vg which is 2 into 10 power 8 uh, lambda which is 1.5 micron. So, 1.5 into 10 power minus 6 and then uh, multiplied by um, 10 power minus 3, but this is given in degree per r. Um, so, typically we want to find delta phi in terms of radians. So, so what do you do? So, you have to multiply this by pi by 180 and, uh, uh, and you want to convert this to seconds. Uh, so, that is basically 3600 seconds. Okay. So, um, if you crunch all these numbers, um, you will find that the final value is in the order of about uh, 4 into 10 power minus 9 radians. Okay. So, that is actually a, a quite a small value uh, 4 into 10 power minus 9 radians and uh, uh, especially um, if you think about uh, how we are going to use it, uh, we are going to use it inside an interferometer. Uh, so, uh, the interferometer output is going to be given by uh, let us say I t is uh, I naught um, which is which is basically the uh, uh, input intensity um, multiplied by 1 plus uh, cos of uh, delta phi. Okay. So, you can just put a square bracket over here. Okay. And so, when you are talking about 4 into 10 power minus 9 radians, that means it is actually a very small intensity. And, and on top of that, um, if you really look at how we are operating this, um, if I look at I t as a function of uh, delta phi, okay, you are, um, it is it's going to be something like this. Uh, so, you start with I naught when uh, delta phi equal to 0 and then it goes to a minimum. Uh, it goes to a zero and then maximum and then and then, then a minimum and so on. Um, where it goes to a minimum, that will be at a value of delta phi equal to pi, and uh, then it goes to a maximum at uh, uh, two pi and and so on, right? Um, but if we look at this operating point over here. Um, we are uh, starting with a case where your clockwise wave and your counterclockwise waves uh, are, are essentially going through the same path length. Uh, so, their phase will cancel each other and the only thing we are looking at is if there is any uh, rotation, then the phase might actually show up a little bit around here. So, your, your operating point is over here and uh, that means it is uh, at this point because the cos uh, function is, is relatively flat over here, that is actually poor sensitivity. So, where do you get the most uh, sensitivity? Well, that would correspond to uh, somewhere over here in the linear part of this curve and uh, if you pay close attention, you will find that this corresponds to uh, value of pi by 2. So, you need to operate in uh, uh, what is called this uh, quadrature point for uh, best uh, sensitivity. 
So, uh, like we did uh, in the previous cases, uh, we can operate in the quadrature point uh, provided we uh, have uh, let us say uh, a phase shift that is incorporated inside this uh, uh, loop. Okay. Um, so, let us let us actually first look at what if we operate in the quadrature point then this is basically uh, says uh, I naught 1 plus cos of pi by 2 plus uh, delta phi which corresponds to sin of delta phi and for small values of uh, sin of uh, delta phi that is equivalent to delta phi by itself. So, what we are looking at is uh, this component is actually going to uh, if you call this delta i that is the change in intensity because of this uh, uh, change in uh, phase. Um, so, that actually for this particular case it is uh, 4 into 10 power minus 9 uh, multiplied by i naught right. So, you are looking at very small uh, changes in intensity 4 into 10 power minus 9 uh, changes in intensity or in other words you can also write it as uh, in terms of power. So, uh, we are looking at 4 into 10 power minus 9 multiplied by the input power. So, that almost uh, suggests that okay, as you increase your input power you are going to end up uh, having better uh, uh, sensitivity uh, right. So, you, you have uh, e, uh, larger signal that you can pick up, but what is the downside of that? Well, as you keep increasing the power the uh, amount of light that is falling on the photodiode is going to keep increasing and, and that essentially gives rise to short noise like what we have seen before. So, uh, it is not like you can just keep increasing the, uh, the optical power that is uh, uh, that you are uh, feeding into the loop ok. So, there is a limit to that we will come back and uh, take a look at it, but uh, uh, but the question is how do we actually bias it for best sensitivity and for that we need to go back here and then see um, how to introduce this bias. Now, I can uh, introduce this bias by uh, basically uh, say incorporating a, a piezoelectric element right a PZT element which uh, we saw previously uh, we introduced that in one of the arms of a magazine interferometer previously to realize that hydrophone to realize that phase generated carrier. So, you can do a similar thing over here except for the fact that if you have a, a, a a phase uh, change incorporated which is uh, just a static phase change, then both the clockwise as well as the counterclockwise waves are going to experience that and uh, then they will essentially cancel each other. So, you essentially set this PZT for uh, this uh, quadrature uh, 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 phase point right. So, you basically you uh, introduce a pi by 2. Uh, phase shift there, but pi by 2 will be the phase shift that both the clockwise as well as the counterclockwise waves are going to see. So, they will essentially cancel each other. So, you will um, go back to this uh, same point over here, right. So, you are not moving over here. So, to really move over here, what you are going to have to do is you apply you give a phase shift of pi by 2 uh, initially for the uh, clockwise uh, wave right. So, so you, you initially for the clockwise wave you have uh, uh, let us say plus pi by 2 uh, phase shift and uh, by the time uh, the, the uh, the other wave comes around by the time uh, the counterclockwise wave comes around you need to actually uh, shift the uh, phase right. So, if you keep the same phase then uh, it is it's, it's actually going to just cancel between the two, but if you um, uh, shift the phase so that the counterclockwise actually. Uh, so, this is for the clockwise beam 
but before the counterclockwise wave comes around which corresponds to roughly this uh, round trip time right this uh, uh, t uh, you change the phase shift so essentially when you change that phase shift you are uh, going to have a condition where uh, uh, you you will you will keep uh, the interferometer and quadrature position uh, at, at that at that point itself and of course you can play this game with uh, uh, you know doing this uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, switching between uh, the phases um, you know you can do that at a particular frequency and you can lock to that frequency and all of that the same things that we saw as far as the interferometric fog is concerned. Uh, so, uh, previously we saw that for the hydrophone, but you can apply the same principles for the interferometric fog as well. So, let us look into some of those details in the next lecture.